Good evening and welcome everyone to tonight's webinar that we've called the National Infrastructure Bank, a solution to congressional insanity. And if you're like Einstein or many other of our fellow American citizens, you agree that doing the same old thing in Congress is not producing the results that we need and want to see for our country. So uh, tonight, we think you'll hear a, bit, a better and bigger idea. You'll hear how the National Infrastructure Bank can positively impact our country. You'll hear from various state and local representatives from around the country about the infrastructure needs in their areas and how a National Infrastructure Bank can provide solutions. My name is Julie Olson. I'm a business person in the Pacific Northwest and the chair of the Progressive Caucus for the Alaska Democrats. I'll be your moderator tonight. We have a great lineup of speakers tonight, and I think you'll find it very interesting to hear from these folks around the United States. And at the end of the session, we'll have a question and answer session. So if you do have questions, please jot them down uh, over the course of the presentations. We're really going to try to stay on track and um, uh, make sure everyone has the opportunity to speak. So write down your questions and at the end, uh, raise your hand or wave your hand and we will try to get to you and get your questions or uh, comments in the record. So with that, we're going to go right into our speakers and our first speaker is Alfeka Mutardi. She's a former senior economist with the International Monetary Fund and now the chief economist for the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. Alfeka? Thank you very much, Julie, and welcome to all of our visitors this evening. Really glad to see you. So um, I'd like to do my usual to give you an update of where we are on the economy and uh, where we are on the bill. Um, but I'd, I'd preface it by saying if you're new to our calls and you want to learn more about the, the nitty gritty nuts and bolts of how the National Infrastructure Bank proposal works, there are lots of videos uh, on our website, nibcoalition.com. So where are we on the economy? Uh, it, it, it's looking sort of okay so far. Uh, the uh, GDP growth is slowing. Uh, it'll probably come in at 2.2% uh, in the final quarter of 2003. We had been ex expecting a recession for a long time, but it, the growth was kept buoyed by consumer spending. However, a lot of consumers are putting all of this, per, all of these purchases on their credit card these days, and they're facing higher interest rates on their credit card. So that cannot last. The labor market is softening a little bit. Unemployment is at 3.7% where it stayed and uh, indicators are slowing. CPA and CPI inflation jumped in December to three and a half to 3.7 percent That may cause the Fed to reconsider its suggestion of rate cuts uh, in 2024. Uh, rates are still at a high level, 5.7%. That's going to still work its way through the economy as people come in for refinancing loans, especially the commercial real estate sector that's in big trouble. It has a lot of vacancies. A lot of those loans could uh, go um, bust. So the conference board, as a result, still expects a shallow recession in the first half of 2024 based on flat indicators like manufacturing orders and that other kind of thing. And banks are still under stress. Uh, the B Bureau of Economic Analysis shows has a plot that shows that bank profits have plunged since mid-2022 when the Fed began its, its interest rate policies. Uh, and a lot of banks today were uh, downgraded. Uh, I think they expect to see poor earnings reports when they all, all the banks come in uh, for their quarterly earnings uh, tomorrow. So stay tuned for that. Uh, the budget is still in crisis. Uh, it's, it really is, epitomizes uh, Albert Einstein's definition of insanity to keep trying the same thing over again and expecting a different result. National debt is now exceeding $34 trillion. This year, despite the good, the good economy, the, the deficit is going to be $1.7 trillion, which is very unusual during economic growth. Uh, we're now in a vicious circle of paying higher interest on the debt because of Fed policies and higher interest rates. So what does the budget crisis look like as of today? His Washington Post article. As of today, Speaker Johnson and Senate Majority Leader Schumer have agreed 
to a spending level of, of 1.6 trillion for fiscal 2024. That turns out to be 70 billion more than both parties agreed to a year ago to raise the debt limit. So plus they are, they are gonna call, claw back about $26 billion from IRS and COVID spending, Probably all of that, that'll bring them up to $100 billion more in spending, probably for uh, Ukraine and Israel and maybe some uh, border security. A third continuing resolution needs to be signed by noon on Saturday to avoid a, a government shutdown. This will be the third resolution. Uh, the right wing uh, of caucus in the House is furious that Johnson uh, didn't come up with any deep budget cuts or immigration reform. It probably means that in order to pass a budget, even to pass a continuing resolution, they're going to need Democratic support. So they, the far right might go after Johnson to try and de depose him the same way that they did with uh, Kevin McCarthy in October. This is all the same, same. Spin and repeat uh, shows you that the budget is in crisis and their approach is not working. It's the same thing over and again, and it's not working. Meanwhile, state budgets are in crises as well. Uh, there are big deficits in California. Maryland is going to have to cut back almost all of its transportation spending budget on account of uh, budget deficits. They're also large in Arizona, Indiana, Massachusetts, and New York. Uh, this will really impact infrastructure spending uh, in the coming months. NIB is a budget workaround. It's incorporated as an independent public bank. It has no need for spending through the budget. No new taxes or deficits are needed to uh, run this bank. It's uh, in, it's capitalized using private money, uh, private treasuries, and then it gives out loans just like a commercial bank does. So it doesn't need budget you know, spending. It's big enough to cover what we need. So here's what we need, according to the American Society of Civil Engineers, and then we added some categories of our own. Here's what the bipartisan law is providing. Only one tenth of what we need. We need the National Infrastructure Bank, which is large enough to top, top up, provide the other 90%. And if we go into a recession, uh, this NIB can offset it by hiring off any, anybody that's unemployed. In fact, the NIB is the only proven way to solve our debt problem. Here's what our debt has looked like over time. Uh, compared to, uh, as divided by GDP, it peaked uh, at, in World War II at 110% of GDP and then fell down to 25% to of GDP. How did that happen? Because the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, with all of its great investments, had supercharged economic growth. So the bottom part of the formula was rising and that lowered the debt. Same thing can happen again with the National Infrastructure Bank. Here's what a scenario what might look like. If we stay on track with the same same that we're doing now, the debt keeps rising as a percent of GDP. There's no option in the budget to fix this. The NIB is the only off-budget option to fix it. Uh, moreover, current policies are not helping the average American person. A person with a college degree who's not living, say, in a large city, it's mostly white, older, uh, they, they tend to be more religious, but these people feel abandoned by the system. And they are, according to uh, Robert Reich. And then add on wealth concentration and corporate influence is really um, pulling things away from the average worker. Uh, we cannot fix this through the budget. The three Bidenomics acts uh, that were paid through the budget are too small. They're a good start, but they're too small. Even President Biden admits that they're too small. Yet, he keeps doubling down and saying the economy is fine. The polls contradict him. Polls show that government, the seven in 10 people, adults, from all walks of life, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, name the economy in an open-ended question on what they want the, econ the government to fix. And no policy right now is addressing this. The housing is in crisis. Uh, people's rents are going through the roof. Uh, 40 million people are in danger of becoming homeless because uh, they're paying more than 50% of their income on rent. Uh, life expectancy is actually declined. Childhood poverty has doubled in the last couple of years. And the National Low Income Housing says we need at least 7 million more affordable housing units. Only the NIB will cover that. It's the only policy that's big enough to reach the working poor by providing them with great paying jobs. So where are we with the bill? 
Currently, we have 24 co-sponsors on the bill, including Rep. Danny Davis from Chicago, Illinois, the main sponsor. We've just been adding a few more of them over the last several days. What has really, really worked well are letters from legislators. And you're going to hear from a lot of these legislators today, uh, writing to their members of Congress saying, your bills are not paying for this, this, and this in my district. Uh, I need you to pass the National Infrastructure Bank so we can cover everything. So that's where we are. And I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thanks, Alfeca. Appreciate that update. Our next speaker is a noted economist and author, and also the former, a former managing director for Goldman Sachs Group. Please welcome Nomi, Dr. Nomi Prinz um, to our webinar. Nomi, you have the stage. Thank you, Julie. And by the way, thank you for everything you have been doing for all of these monthly meetings. Um, you, you, you deserve, and everything else you do. I just wanted to say that, have I not said that before? And obviously I'll feck all the work you're doing and everybody here, um, happy new year. Um, although not so happy if you actually take on board everything Alfeca just told us about the economy. Um, just to add into uh, Albert Einstein, Mark, Mark Twain said, um, suppose you were an idiot and suppose you were a member of Congress, but I repeat myself. <laughs> um, this was the quote that opened my book, All the President's Bankers, when I took a look at all the bipartisan policies and relationships between presidents and the financial industry, which I'm going to just get to in a second, um, since the... Uh, late 1800s. Um, and, and there are a lot of issues that come up that this bank, um, the NIB actually um, solve. And there is a historical precedent, um, which Alfeca has talked about many times, which is in the documents about how many times a similar type of bank has been instituted in the United States or financing. And it has worked to grow our economy, to decrease the amount of debt that we have relative to the growth of the economy that we need, and to basically make us more competitive as a nation, um, and also to make more equal um, the lives, uh, the financial lives, the economic lives of our citizens. So right now we're in disarray on so many of those issues, as we all know, and going into the election, um, people feel pinched. Credit card debt is at all time highs. The U.S. debt is at all time highs. The debt to GDP ratio is almost at near highs. And there was a very interesting article out in Bloomberg today where the where uh, Bloomberg was wondering what was going to happen to the more than seven trillion dollars worth of effectively bonds, which were bought with effectively printed money by the Federal Reserve that's hanging out on the books of the Federal Reserve. Um, when we talk about the National Infrastructure Bank to finance it, what we're talking about is taking a teeny tiny fraction of the treasury bonds, the debt that the United States has issued and that it owes interest on right as we speak right now, and the, for which the Fed has a $7 trillion portion, that's mortgages and treasuries, but still a lot of debt, um, that isn't being used to grow the economy. It's literally sitting on the Fed's book. It's sitting in the books of pension funds. It's sitting in the book of private banks. Um, and it's not money that is coming into the real economy. So we have this massive disconnect, which people are feeling at a time where banks are actually struggling more than usual. Goldman Sachs, where I used to work, had a horribly bad earnings in which they, oh well, um, had the lowest profit that they reported in four years. So you know, if even Goldman Sachs is hurting, um, that the, the financial system is in disarray. And we still have a lot of regional banks that will be reporting earnings, um, as Alfeca mentioned, and, and they themselves are so pinched that not only can the large national and global institutional banks not provide money to grow infrastructure and for long-term projects to do that, but the regional banks in many rural areas and throughout the country, in particular the Midwest, um, are really struggling to even stay afloat. We saw just a year ago, actually March a year ago, a little bit less than, um, than a year ago, uh, three large banks fail. The Fed created money to bail them out kind of in a little bit of a hidden pro, um, sort of program that they, they had, which is going to be expiring on March 11th. So there's a lot of banks that are on life support right now on the regional side as well, um, which cannot lend to these types of projects, especially if they don't exist anymore, they're struggling to basically stay afloat. So there's a lot of breaks in the financial system as well as um, from a policy perspective in terms of funding infrastructure the way we need it to be funded. And the most logical thing about this proposal is that it doesn't put a tiny bit of financing into the system. It looks at the massive amount of, of infrastructure that we need to build. It recognizes that you can't build it in 10 minutes. It recognizes that you can't have a budget conversation every six months or a year or whenever when you can't even keep the same house speaker 
were presiding over over their own party's uh, discussions about the budget um, in a seat. So we need something that's more long term than that. We need something that is smarter than that. We had two really good meetings today, and there's many meetings that continue to happen. I know there's someone from North Carolina on this call later, um, but in the in the principle of connecting from the ground up to the federal um, sort of government that needs to potentially vote on this. Um, we, we had a decent call with um, a North Carolina Republican congressman's legislative um, or financial services aid. And that person would be, I am sure, able to pick up a phone call from someone on the local side, the state side of North Carolina, and have a discussion about how just on that basis, we can build from the ground up. So that's the kind of way we start to get. We need Republicans on, on this bill. We've talked to a lot of them on the energy side because they actually care about energy, they actually care about being reelected. They actually do care um, about economic security for the constituents if they're going to vote for them. So there's a lot of reasons to, I think, at this point, we have great 24 and, and growing Democrats on this bill. I, I keep that we need to get Republicans on this bill. They do have have um, the ability to listen to their local constituents and their state constituents. And I think that anyone um, on these calls, um, as has been happening throughout, um, you know, the, the, the push for the NIB um, can also connect and make those same calls and potentially have those or connect into Zoom meetings or whatever to push from the state level, particularly on the Republican side, so that we can get um, that bipartisan nature, so that we can get momentum, so that we can actually have a conversation about real stuff like infrastructure and the economy and solutions, um, rather than who's going to be the next House Speaker, um, or at least at the same time. So um, the, these are all things that, that I think are really important now. Um, yeah, I know we have a lot of people on this call. I'm, I'm happy that we have some momentum, and I'm looking forward to more of that growing this year. Thank you, Nomi. Uh, we do have a lot of momentum going. I believe Alfeca mentioned that we just picked up a couple of sponsors and we have some more in the works. And later on in the call, you'll hear how you can help us uh, get some more sponsors and keep the momentum going. So I'd like to go right to our next speaker. And we have with us uh, Ellen Brown. She is the chair of the Public Banking Institute out of Los Angeles. Ellen, I think you have a presentation for us. Yeah, thanks. I need to share my screen, but I'm not seeing it. Oh, there. George Washington said in his farewell address to avoid foreign entanglements, avoid excessive debt, and avoid political infighting. And we, we've just heard we're obviously doing all three, three of those things. Let me see if I can. Um, <clears throat> so the, the debt, uh, the bill, well, anyway, Alfeca went through all that, so... We have uh, infighting on the bill, $34 trillion debt, unbelievable. Uh, interest on the debt is uh, nearly uh, nearly half of income tax receipts. And then we have all these infrastructure needs as well. So, uh, but, but we've been here before uh, the, <laughs> sorry, uh, it, Hamilton and Lincoln and Roosevelt all all pulled us through similar debt situations, and they did it with what 19th century economists called the American system of sovereign money and credit. So this was uh, as opposed to the British system of colonial feudalism and parasitic exploitation. Henry Carey was Lincoln's economic advisor, and he said, Two systems are before the world. One looks to pauperism, ignorance, depopulation, and barbarism. The other in increasing wealth, comfort, intelligence, combination of action and civilization, et cetera. Obviously the English was the better. <laughs> um, so when Hamilton became first US Treasury Secretary in Washington's time, we were uh, $77 million in debt after the, after the Revolutionary War. So that was a huge debt. And Hamilton solved the problem with debt for equity swaps. So that's the model we want to follow, the Hamiltonian American system model. Uh, state debt was accepted in partial payment for stock in the first U.S. bank, paying a 6% dividend. And then that um, capital was leveraged into credit issued as the first U.S. currency. So, of course, then they didn't just write it into your account. They printed paper dollars. I mean, they didn't have computers. Uh, the loans were based on the fractional reserve model. 
Hamilton said, it is a well-established fact that banks in good credit can circulate a far greater sum than the actual quantum of their capital in gold and silver. So that was a, a model established by the Bank of England, but they were using it for different purposes. The Bank of the um, U.S. Bank followed Hamilton's system of public credit, which was to issue this credit specifically for government and private interests for internal improvements and other economic development. Hamilton was, of course, had lived through the Revolutionary War, and he he saw that one of the major triggers of the war was the fact that Brit under British law, the colonists were not allowed to establish their own industries. So he felt that establishing a strong industrial system was the best way to gain financial independence. So he co-founded something called the Society for Establishing Useful Manufacturers. And that society established the first planned industrial city, which is in Patterson, New Jersey. And it, it started out with um, just with a cotton mill, but then it grew and grew and it was very successful over the 19th century and established the pattern of the American Industrial Revolution. So the first U.S. bank was a national development bank, and so was the second U.S. bank, which um, did quite a great deal of economic development, most notably the Erie Canal. But President Andrew Jackson declared war on the bank and shut it down. So when Lincoln came into office, he was faced with a civil war and the prospect of having to borrow at 26, 24 to 36 percent interest from the British backed bankers. So what he which would have, you know, of course, put us horribly into debt. So what he did instead was to revert to the system of the American colonists, which was just to issue the money directly as greenbacks. In fact, so much was issued that it actually doubled the money supply. And the government also founded the national bank system, which uh, required national, but in order to become a national bank, you had to capitalize your bank with uh, government debt or your, sorry, capitalize your bank notes with government debt. And with those two sources of funding, Lincoln's government managed to win the, uh, the Civil War and fund a great deal of economic development, most notably the Transcontinental Railroad, which was finished in 1869 and actually returned a profit to the government. Uh, and for all that, after the Civil War, we did not see a spike in inflation. Prices remained stable. And the reason was that supply went up along with demand. But uh, Lincoln was assassinated, uh, the greenbacks were discontinued, silver was demonetized, so the money supply shrank and we had a deep depression. And then we got the Federal Reserve in 1913. Mm -hmm. And in the 1920s, we got, um, the, of course, the crash of 1929. And 9,000 banks failed after that, $7 billion in deposits were frozen, the money supply shrank. And the Fed Federal Reserve was instituted supposedly to prevent the sort of bank run, but it didn't work. I mean, there are various reasons which I won't try to go into, but anyway, the Fed didn't work. So uh, Roosevelt's government stepped in and took over the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which had been established by President Hoover to bail out the banks, but it hadn't actually worked for that either. So they used that to leverage credit for manufacturing and development, which was the uh, American system, the Hamiltonian system. Uh, they started with a modest $500 million in capitalization issued bonds. And over the next 25 years, Lenter invested over $40 billion. So they rebuilt the country with the New Deal, with you know dams, electricity, all the amazing things they did in the 1930s, and then funded America's participation in World War II, and for all that, managed to return a profit to the government. So an excellent model. And we can do that as well with HR 4052, um, starting with $500 billion in, in federal securities for which we would, or the, anyway, the NAB would sw uh, swap non-voting preferred stocks. So, so the investors would get the interest on their bonds as well as 2% to make it attractive to the investors. And it can either take deposits or issue bonds or both. 
in order to generate liquidity and use that to leverage that 500 billion into 5 trillion in credit, of course, over a long period of time. I mean, it's not like they would just suddenly flood the economy with five, 500, I mean, sorry, with $5 trillion in credit, you'd have money coming in and, and um, or local governments that, that didn't have the money to fund the projects that or they could um, pay, pay them back with the whatever was generated by the loan so they could pay it back. I mean, that's the way this is works. Okay, so that's a workaround that could work, that could escape, do something different that would get us out of the, the repeated insanity of Congress. That's all I got. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. That was a great presentation. And I love these, uh, the historical facts that you come up with. I learned something new every webinar from you. So thank you. Um, next, uh, we're going to um, uh, have on multiple state and local representatives from around the country. We are going to start uh, with Michigan, and we're lucky to have with us this evening Representative Aaron Burns from Dearborn, Michigan. Aaron, can you tell us a little bit about the infrastructure needs in your area in Michigan? Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on tonight. Um, really honored to be here with everyone. Um, and I'm excited to kick things off. So I'll just highlight a few key issues um, in the state of Michigan, and of course, specifically in my district, which includes Dearborn and Dearborn Heights. And for reference for everyone, um, we are just west of the city of Detroit. So we're kind of an inner ring suburb in the metro area. Um, so the first issue that I'll highlight that the National Infrastructure Bank and the funding that of course would come with it uh, would really help us with um, is water infrastructure. And I think this is something that we're dealing with, of course, across the country and across the world, really, um, with the realities of climate change that we're experiencing now and that we've been, you know, kind of taking hits on um, over the last few years. So in 2021, um, our metro area, um, and my district in particular, experienced catastrophic flooding. Um, we had multiple inches of rain within less than a 24-hour period. And so we saw massive flooding of streets, basements. Um, it was really just a devastating flood. Um, my parents' basement flooded. I was on city council in Dearborn at the time, and I went out with our Dearborn firefighters to clean out um, basements that had been flooded in the homes of senior citizens who were just not physically able to do the clean-out work. Um, and it was heart-wrenching. I'll tell you, you know, we're here talking about funding and dollars and infrastructure. But I think what we're really talking about here is people, right? How do we help um, the people who need it most? And cleaning out those basements and having to haul out just waterlogged um, items and mementos and just, you know, family memories that went back decades for some folks um, was really heart-wrenching. And it's something that no one should have to go through. So for us, um, again, in the metro area and really throughout the state of Michigan, um, water infrastructure and how we manage um, stormwater in particular is beyond critical for us. Um, so funding from the NIB really for us would be um, essential to empower our cities and the state, of course, um, to make good decisions and well-funded, adequately funded decisions um, on behalf of our residents that we all need it so desperately. Um, so I'll start there. Um, another piece I'd like to note, um, just as I'm talking about water and needs on that front, um, would be lead service lines. Um, so Michigan has tens of thousands of lead service lines throughout the state. Um, and municipalities have been given a mandate to replace the outdated kind of unsafe lead lines. Um, but of course, funding, unfortunately, has not been attached. Um, so it's an unfunded mandate. Um, I saw this up close when I was on Dearborn City Council now being in the legislature for the past year, almost a year and one month at this point, um, I see how critical this need is. And it's really a huge concern for municipalities when it comes to funding. Um, you know, I think local leaders want and need to do right by their residents. Um, and they're also, you know, kind of experiencing their backs being up against the wall when it comes to funding these projects. And I'm sure as everyone on the call is familiar with, 
Several years ago, the city of Flint um, here in Michigan suffered a tremendous um, public health crisis um, based on tainted water. Um, and that is a crisis that started several years ago and, you know, continues on because people are sick. Um, people have been, you know, going to their doctors, going to the hospital, um, dealing with all sorts of illnesses um, as a result of this water crisis. And this is something that made national and global news and rightfully so um, and it's an issue that I think still deeply harms people and needs to be addressed and I think oftentimes when we talk about lead lines um, and who that hurts we know that it tends to impact our most vulnerable communities um, in terms of identity um, and geography and so we really I think need to acknowledge that this is a public health crisis um, and it's also an issue of social justice. So that's something that's really critical for us in the state of Michigan. And the last thing I'll mention, then I'll pass the mic to uh, to the next speaker, um, is public transit. So when we think about infrastructure in Michigan, um, as many folks know, I'm sure, you know, Detroit is known as the Motor City. And that really is um, part of our culture here. We are a car culture through and through. Um, and, you know, we're also looking at ways to kind of, I would say, grow maybe out of that a bit. Um, you know, of course, we're investing heavily in electric vehicles, charging stations, all of that infrastructure. So that's really critical for us. Um, but, you know, we're also looking at mass transit. Um, you know, the metro area has never had a subway system. And as someone who lived in New York City for a while, um, that's something that I really miss. It's a blessing to be able to just hop on a train and go about your day. Um, and so we're looking at that in terms of really retaining residents, especially our younger residents, recent college grads. And we also are looking to grow our population. Population. Um, Governor Whitmer established, uh, you know, Population Growth Council recently, and this is something that really impacts um, whether or not people stay here in Michigan or whether people want to come live and work and spend time in our state. Um, and so that's something that's really critical and something that I think the National Infrastructure Bank could really help us actualize. Um, we have a lot of ideas and a lot of goals, but we need the funding to get there. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Erin. Really appreciate you being here. And I think that um, people will see the similarities that we're all facing around the country, water issues, transportation issues, and, and that sort of thing. So there's a commonality uh, all around the country in terms of uh, the needs that we have. So next, let's go to New England. Uh, we have with us uh, this evening, Representative Kate Nugent from Crittenden, Vermont. She's in the Vermont um, House of Representatives. Kate? Thank you so much uh, for having me. And um, I almost want to say ditto to almost everything Representative Burns just said, except that Vermont does not have a city as big as Detroit, but so much of the same uh, challenges we are facing right now. Um, I thought I would just give a little background about me and um, my motivation for being interested in this and supporting this um, initiative and also uh, Vermont and my community's needs. Um, I'm originally from Massachusetts in Vermont. They would call that a, um, now the term is escaping me, but <laughs> not from Vermont originally. Um, and both my parents are kind, were kind of like, um, you know, of their time, like both had associate's degrees. Um, they worked really hard. They kind of, you know, made their own luck. Um, but I could see, you know, the stresses um, when I was a kid uh, from economic forces I now understand we're impacting them and so many other families like them. Their, um, you know, their parents were living the American dream. Like my grandfather was a postal worker and was able to afford his own house. Um, his wife didn't even work and had um, four kids and they lived in the suburbs of Massachusetts. And, you know, I think the dream was their kids would do better than they, they did. And then my parents, um, you know, they had to have two income, um, fewer kids and, it, you know, sometimes it was hard to come up with money for things like braces or school trips or um, like after school fees. And I could see the stress of that um, on my family and made us feel sometimes like we didn't really belong in our communities. And so I really see um, this economic issue so tied to the polarization and the community um, connectedness that we all want and that it's um, a real struggle right now in our country. Um, 
and I know, you know, I want that for my own son and my husband and I, we have, <laughs> we have one child, both of us have master's degrees and we are struggling, um, you know, it's, it's grateful for what we have, but still wish we could do more. And um, the housing crunch in Vermont, I think is one of the tightest in the whole country in a problem that's global. Um, and so there's just not a lot of movement. There's not a lot of opportunity to, to expand a tiny little bit, even if that's what you're hoping to do. So I see um, that in my district too. I was really struck by it when I, I I'm also in my um, second year of my first term, um, but walking around my district, it was definitely the undercurrent of every single conversation I had, which actually surprised me because when I went out, I was uh, really concerned about climate change. And that was kind of like one of my motivating issues, but um, humbled and kind of um, just felt like I feel for people, like everyone's feeling like that, like they want to provide something better for their kids than they have. Um, I think we made the American dream a little bit too academic at some point and just dismissed it and said, oh, well, people just want to be millionaires, so we shouldn't uh, even think about the American dream. And I, I just was um, totally transformed by listening to my constituents and realizing, no, they just want to feel like they're building something that they can give their kids that's better than what they had, and they're not feeling that way right now. They're feeling stalled and um, and stuck, and I think that is um, a big part of why the even the economy is doing well, people don't feel so great. Um, so I was very intrigued by this um, national infrastructure bank idea and um, and the kind of promise to um, build physical infrastructure and then also with that some hope and some um you know kind of like fall in love with our country again like it's we have to we have to reckon with the things that are not so great but i think we have to also see the potential and what we mean to the world and like part of that's investing in ourselves um, and so in vermont um, we just went through historic flooding which i um, luckily in my community did not impact super directly but i did um go down and um, help muck out some houses in, um, in Barrie, which is right next to the capital city. And that was heartbreaking uh, just to watch people's lives, you know, come out of their basements and realize the enormity of the cost of rebuilding um, that we are facing right now. And I know we need federal matching fund, even though the federal funds um, will help, we still need a lot more funding to support that rebuilding. Um, just in the capital, um, Plaza or district alone, which is Montpelier, which is right next to Barry, um, they're estimating that it's going to cost 24 million just for the capital complex to um, address the issues that came up with the flooding. Um, <clears throat> and so that is a huge amount of money, and at a time when things are shrinking, um, our economic abilities are shrinking right now. Um, we also have um, the housing issue, so housing flexibility, and then our schools. Um, are in the measure um, of like how much life is left in them, they're about at 80% in our, in our community and across the state. Um, you know, 74 out of 384 have fire and safety issues. Um, almost every school in Vermont needs some kind of major reconstruction and has been deferring maintenance. So, and we don't have the funds to, to really do that. Um, and we're also facing a big tax increase just for the cost of putting school you know, having these schools. So, um, and then one last thing um, is locally in South Burlington, Vermont, which is the town that I, or the city I represent part of, um, we are looking to build a bike pedestrian bridge that connects South Burlington to Burlington, uh, which is like, you know, the main economic area of the state and um, serves the University of Vermont and a um, whole bunch of people even beyond the community. Um, and this bridge would mitigate the issue of the highway that bifurcated that area. So it's a huge project that would probably bring a lot of economic um, uh, <clears throat> energy to the area. And um, we do have a federal grant to pay for some of that, but I believe it's about $5 million out of the $14 million total that um, we need to make up with some funding. So that's just a small <laughs> amount of the needs, I think, in Vermont, too. So thank you so much for having me, and I'm really excited to hear from all these amazing speakers. Thank you, Representative Nugent. Um, it was very interesting to uh, hear about the, the issues there in Vermont. 
Uh, and um, hopefully you'll stick around for the Q&A because we might have some uh, questions uh, come up for you. Um, okay, now let's go back to Illinois. Uh, we have Representative Harry Benton here. And um, um, of course, Representative Danny Davis from Illinois is the lead sponsor for the resolution in Congress. So Representative Benton, can you share a few words with us? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, uh, well, thank you for having me. I'm one of the chief co-sponsors of the House resolution in the state of Illinois on the House side. Uh, it's a it's a big deal. I'm an iron worker by trade, as you can see by my beautiful picture behind me. Uh, I've, I've never eaten lunch on a beam. I like to sit down somewhere where it's safe. Uh, thank you, OSHA. Things have changed. Um, but this is stuff that I work on on a regular basis. I, I build bridges by day and I go and work on building bridges and politics down in Springfield. So we have some major challenges in the state of Illinois right now. I think everybody that's watching the news knows that we've spent over a billion dollars on the migrant crisis. And that's just going to keep getting larger and larger. It's a difficult topic that we're dealing with in Illinois. Uh, just south of my district, uh, we have the largest inland port in America. So 5 million trucks a year are on our highways and on our roads just out of that one location. So we are the transportation hub for around the world. We work on a lot of rail. We work on a lot of uh, infrastructure. We have $3.6 billion just going to a 16-mile stretch. We have to redo all the bridges. Uh, we redo all uh, the widening, try to get these trucks out a little bit faster. Uh, we also have... Uh, some major challenges with the city of Chicago, building out the infrastructure, working on potential high-speed rail. We do have some $3 billion that's going to be going to high-speed rail to take rail from Chicago to Springfield and Springfield to St. Louis. It's going to be a great thing to try to get people out and try to get them back and forth. And some of the major challenges that we're having. And one of the reasons why I ended up hopping on the child care and early childhood education committee is, and if you look at me, you wouldn't think that I'm one of the biggest advocates on that committee, but I am. Uh, my wife and I just spent $30,000 last year on child care for two kids. I think that's one of the number one issues across the country. Thank God for a full day kindergarten because we saved $6,000 for half the year, we're gonna save about $10,000 more this year. Uh, we passed full day kindergarten throughout the entire state in the state of Illinois. We worked on some pretty great things for working people. And that's what I think this bill is. I think this is a working class bill that is going to expand the middle class. It is going to create good paying jobs, good training opportunities, get people into the workplace. And if we can work on the right components, we can work on trying to get secondary income back in the household. Because along with those childcare challenges, uh, a lot of households are losing their secondary income. They're not seeing the their spouse, whether it's uh, husband or wife or boyfriend, girlfriend, however it is, getting into the workplace and justifying the costs. So, you know, if, if we can keep expanding this out by $5 trillion and, and build bridges and build water, we have another billion dollar project just to bring fresh water supply to the city of Joliet and surrounding areas because their aquifer is drying up. Uh, water is going to be gold across the country. So water infrastructure is huge. I have another community. I have three of the largest cities in the state of Illinois that I cover. Uh, Aurora alone has about 15,000 lead service lines that they have to fix. Uh, it's a daunting number. A lot of my other municipalities have changed out those, those lead service lines, but anybody that uh, looks at somebody like Aaron can attest to this, uh, Flint, Michigan, uh, being from Michigan, it's, it, it's just devastating what's happening when people can't don't have fresh water supplies or have tainted water supplies within their household. Uh, there's, there's so many more things that I could talk about, but I think this is a great idea. I have had a lot of conversations, both federally. I've had conversations with building trades. I've had conversa conversations with 
energy providers such as ComEd. I just talked to them yesterday. Uh, they were just ranked number one electric provider in the country. Their infrastructure is amazing, and they're going to deal with some major challenges along with anybody that lives in the MISO region knows that you know energy costs tripled. It went from $76 a megawatt generation to 235 in a matter of a year. So we are definitely going to have to fix the challenges there across MISO. There's been conversations federally to dissolve MISO and change out those, uh, those regions, but that's going to cost billions of dollars to do. And anything that we can do to try to put money back in the, the pockets of families, fix our infrastructure, uh, fix potholes. Potholes are a killer for low-income families. You, you get a flat tire, you crack a wheel, and next thing you know, you can't go to work. So it's just simple things like that that are going to help out uh, low- and middle-class families. And it's also going to help out with all of our uh, municipalities that are looking at economic development to have viable infrastructure to get more business back into their economies and expand out their tax base. So I always look at things from not only a business perspective, but a working perspective. And I try to see it from all different lenses, and I, I can't find a flaw with this one. So... I'm on board and anything you need from me, just let me know. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Harry. Really appreciate your comments. Uh, okay, now we're going to go down to Georgia. Uh, we have with us tonight Representative Sam Park from Lawrenceville, Georgia. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be with you all. I hope you all can hear me okay. Uh, my name is Sam Park. I'm the Georgia State Representative for House District 107. Uh, I'm in my fourth term, eighth year in the legislature, and I currently serve as the whip of the Georgia House Democratic Caucus. Uh, so uh, late last year, I had an opportunity to meet with some of the folks from the Coalition for National Infrastructure Bank, um, and I certainly remain very interested and supportive of this endeavor, especially given the need that exists for greater investments in infrastructure in my home state of Georgia. Uh, so currently, Georgia has had a budget surplus of a few billion dollars for the past uh, three to four fiscal years, which I would characterize as artificial because of unprecedented underestimates of state revenue collect collections uh, in a state with a growing population. As a result, Georgia has not invested into needed public infrastructure to keep up with our growing state. We have made some progress over the past few years. Um, according to the Georgia section of the American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, their report card had us going from a C to a C plus. Uh, mm -hmm. Some improvement, uh, but clearly uh, lots of room uh, for improvement. Uh, so for, for this evening, um, I'd like to highlight a few areas where the creation of a national infrastructure bank uh, would be absolutely essential for very important areas uh, in the state of Georgia. Uh, so first, uh, transit, roads, and bridges, and, and I'm sure uh, some of my comments will be very similar to what legislators from other states have said. But here in Georgia, um, we've really had a, a systemic failure uh, to invest in reliable forms of public transportation, uh, which has made the metro Atlanta area and the city of Atlanta the eighth most, in, the eighth most uh, congested city in the world. Uh, in 2016, 90% of trips in Georgia were, were, were made using automobiles, while only 2% were made by transit. The lack of, of tr public transit options has placed greater burdens on Georgia's roads and bridges uh, with a growing population and a growing economy, uh, especially in and around the Port of Savannah, um, as a result of its expansion. Three of the top 20 nation, uh, three of the top 20 nations traffic bottlenecks were on I-285, I a critical highway that encircles the metro Atlanta region where more than half of the state's population or approximately 5.5 million Georgians live. Uh, and, and last year, uh, the legislature um, with, uh, unfortunately it was more partisan than anything, um, uh, passed legislation to increase truck weights or how much trucks can carry, which will accelerate the deterioration of our roads and bridges in which additional uh, appropriations will likely be needed sooner rather than later. Uh, second, uh, the second kind of bucket I'd like to talk about is uh, freight logistics, heavy rail, and high-speed commuter rail. Uh, as I mentioned uh, briefly uh, before, 
with the deepening of the Port of Savannah over the past few years, uh, as of 2021, the port has become the third busiest in the United States. And so greater investments in freight logistics and heavy rail will be necessary to ensure the efficient transportation of goods and goods and goods throughout the state and the region. From a commuter perspective, as Georgia is the largest state east of uh, the Mississippi by landmass, uh, there's always been an interest, especially from legislators in and around the areas, uh, that would invest in high-speed commuter rail between the city of Atlanta uh, and Savannah, including certain parts um, uh, in, in, in rural Georgia. The last critical area I'll touch upon is stormwater and wastewater. Uh, currently, Georgia spends approximately $6 per person on stormwater, whereas the EPA recommends spending approximately $85 per capita to keep up with increased usage. The lack of investment hurts the quality of water and the environment and it makes us less prepared to deal with uh, climate change in which not just will we experience greater risk of flooding, um, but certainly our aging infrastructure is just not equipped to deal uh, with these 100 year storms that seem to be happening uh, with such uh, frequency these days. With respect to wastewater, uh, nearly half of all Georgians do not have access to public sewers. Many still rely on septic systems, especially given our uh, the, our, our rural background, um, and so lots of need and investment there, uh, in which a lot of our local governments simply do not have the funds necessary to keep up with the growth or the transition to connect some of these uh, newer developments uh, to, to um, public sewers. So um, there are many other areas um, where, the, where a new NIB, or the National Infrastructure Bank, could be greatly beneficial, including expansion of rural broadband and affordable housing in Georgia. Uh, so I'm very much supportive um, of, of the project and endeavor. So certainly if there's anything I can do to be of service, uh, do please let me know as well. Thank you, Representative Park. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, okay. Okay, um, next we are going to go to Matthew Miller. He is from New York and uh, I believe is in the Albany County Legislature. Legis yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me on tonight. Um, as uh, she mentioned, uh, I am in the Albany County Legislature. Um, I'm a retired biology teacher, a self-professed environmentalist, a union leader. Um, and so a lot of what I'm going to tell you, I, I've actually now already heard, right? I was all ready to go with these great new things to tell you about. And it seems like we're all suffering from the same the same things. But I'll give a few important examples about upstate New York. Primarily, I support the, the National Inf Infrastructure Bank because we definitely need a new or in this case, a renewed uh, methodology to address these major infrastructure needs. As we continue, unfortunately, to fall behind so many other countries due to the you know aforementioned political inertia, right? If you follow the news, you'll note that New York um, last couple of years has suffered a really dramatic population drain. Um, I think it's the first or second state in population loss. Now, there are plenty of reasons for that, of course, um, but two of them are really the infrastructure and the lack of jobs. And hopefully this bill could address both of those by in improving our infrastructure and creating the jobs that can bring people back. Now, when I talk about New York and, and some of you guys from around here, some may not have familiarity, it's really two worlds, right? You have downstate New York, and I grew up down there, right, on Long Island. It's its own world. When you Once you move up across the, the Tappan Zee Bridge into upstate New York and really up to where I am in the capital of Albany, uh, it's a different whole ballgame. And uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those issues that we have there and um, why it's important to have this bill. So quick history lesson for those that may not know, New York was founded in the 1600s, right? Um, Albany in the mid to late 1600s, one of their first 13 original settlements, became our capital in 1797. So, you know, why does this matter, right? Because everything here is really, really old. Um, we literally have some sewer and, and basic infrastructure that is 150, 200, 250 years old. The city was built in 1648, I believe, and obviously there's been some upgrades, but a lot of it is really bad. So it's our hope that if we can get this through, this the, the National Infrastructure Bank can sort of help us move into modern solutions that not only focus on the green economy, but on climate sustainability. Um, 
So the things I'm going to talk about real quickly, uh, I'm going to talk about Albany because I know it. My district actually touches this, the, this, the southern border of Albany City, um, even though I represent the county. But really, everything this could apply to anywhere in upstate, and upstate is very, very vast area. So this applies to all of it. Um, one of the big things, quite honestly, um, and you probably never heard about this place, but uh, the Livingston Avenue Bridge um, is a rail bridge that crosses the Hudson River was built in 1866 during the Civil War. It had a recent, really uh, recent upgrade in 1901. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, it's it's old. And here's the problem with that. Most, uh, all actually, of the uh, passenger rail and a large amount of the uh, uh, goods that have to travel from the Northeast have to cross that bridge, all right? Um, Anybody coming from Boston, coming up the Empire of the Corridor from New York and all the goods that come from those areas to head out to Harry Benton out in Illinois, they have to cross this bridge to head out um, out west and then anywhere north. And it's been deemed uh, completely inadequate by many federal uh, agencies. And the trains can only go 15 miles per hour over it one at a time. You're talking about all these Amtrak trains, all these uh, intermodal trains carrying all our goods um, and and. We recently, unfortunately, just a few months ago, got rejected for federal funds to replace it. And the problem with that, it's now $400 million. If that bridge fails, the entire economy of this country is going to be affected. Not just the Northeast, but nothing to be able to get out West either, or very little will be able to get that way. So it's one of the things we're looking at, that this would be something, you know, we can get to the, the bank that we could, it's ready to go, the plans are there, and we need to get that running. Um, we also have the lead line issues like everybody else does being so old as we are and, and a lot of the other things that we want to do. But really, uh, the other thing I'll mention up here and it's been touched on, but um, it's important to us in upstate New York, and that's the Hudson River, right? And the combined sewer overflows. Um, because of this old infrastructure and inability to find the money to upgrade, right? Every time we have a precipitation event up here, millions of gallons of untreated sewage flow directly into the Hudson River per minute. Okay, it's millions per minute. Um, and that's a problem. Right? If you know the Hudson River, I live in Mississippi. It's probably the biggest and most important river, I think, in our nation. And it's a tidal river from Troy, just above us here in Albany, all the way out in New York City. And it's, um, you know, we're constantly polluting it and, and destroying it, not, not taking care of it in any way, shape, or form. Um, our town, my actual little township that I live in, we don't have CSOs because we've been able to get funding and grants and we may update our infrastructure so we don't have that any longer. But the city of Albany, city of Troy, which is just north of us, which are river communities and smaller cities like Waterville and Cahoes, you probably never heard of, right? But these are places that their budgets, like the, for the largest cities are either too involved, have too many other issues. And the smaller cities, their budgets just simply aren't large enough to handle the major in, uh, improvements that need to be done. And, and that river needs to be taken care of. So, um, you know, really, that's just a couple of things here. And you can look all around upstate and find all these same issues, whether it be Syracuse, Buffalo, Rochester, or anywhere in between. And I just finished with, you know, listen, big issues need big ideas. And those big ideas need bigger leaders. So we need to be big. And hopefully we can get this through and those representatives out there can talk to their colleagues, you know, and, and make sure this gets passed because we need it right away. Thank you. All right, thank you. We got a uh, both a history and a geography lesson from you. So <laughs> <A little bit. laughs> uh, <laughs> we appreciate that. Okay, um, now um, I think we're gonna go to Q and A soon. And uh, but first of all, uh, we had had somebody had brought up um, um, infrastructure in other countries, and uh, one of the our um, our uh, steady volunteers here with the National Infrastructure Bank is Craig Schwartz. He's out of Ohio and is currently the chair for the Rural Caucus there for the uh, Ohio Democrats. But I know Craig has spent part of his career in Europe, working in Europe. And could you briefly address some of the differences between the standard in infrastructure that we see in Europe versus you know where we're at here in the US? Sorry to put you on the spot like that. Boy, oh boy. Uh, <laughs> can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, good. I'm trying on a new mic. Uh, that's a great question. And I just want to say I'm really, really uh, fascinated by all the speakers tonight coming from uh, from around the area. You, you raised a, a lot of points that obviously uh, we all agree on. The major thing, um, and I, I harp on this a lot, 
Um, but the major difference when I when I saw in Europe was that, and this is obviously because of the war and stuff and the massive reinvestment uh, that went into it, but they buried a lot of their electrical service lines. And that's it would, so you go into t from town to town and everything else, you're not seeing too many wires hanging in the air. And so I, I think in terms of climate change and stuff like that, that's going to serve them well going forward. And we don't do that. Uh, we had just down the street from us, uh, new poles going up, metal poles replacing the wood ones, but they're still hanging the wires in the air. And so they're still susceptible to the different climatic changes that we're going to be going through. Stronger winds. Ohio just had record-setting winds this past week. 60-mile-per-hour winds. Uh, trucks, hundreds of trucks having to, to be uh, go all over the place. So... You know, these are the th major. It's one of the, that's one of the major differences. The other thing, uh, people talk about mass transit, um, and Aaron from Dearborn. I, I you know, I feel for you uh, having to you know deal with that traffic. I was privileged enough, uh, several different places in Paris and London and Munich, to have that uh, advantage of going uh, mass transit, literally going out my door from my flat onto the tube into work in a matter of minutes. And regardless of the condition of the trains, because that was during the Thatcher uh, years, and she didn't put a dime, a dime uh, 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 let's say a, a penny, into mass transit during it. We had the uh, Charing Cross disaster during the time I worked in London. And that was when the rolling stock, the, the train did not stop, went right into the back end of the train station. No, luckily, nobody was in injured. Uh, but the rolling stock, when they pulled it away, was from the 1920s. So I wanted to just real quickly, Julie, let me just add, there's a really good uh, article I just read about the new next generation to sell a trains going in on the Northeast Corridor. They're built in France. And they're only going to be about 10 miles an hour, 10 miles per hour faster than the current generation that needs to be replaced. They're going to have a little more wider seating, a little more comfort, but for the most part, a little more energy efficient, but we have not really upgraded we're not doing the with things that we need to be doing here. But listen, I'll pass that on. Uh, go go to somebody else. Okay. Thank thank you, Craig. Okay. Um, now, many of you on the, uh, the speakers have said, let me know what I can do. Okay. So now comes the portion of our program where we let you know what you can do. And this applies to everybody on the call. So um, uh, if you could send a letter to your congressperson asking them to co-sponsor HRR 4052, that would be great. So we have here a sample letter. This is something that's downloadable from our website. So you would be able to download, download it and do a little modification, i.e. put your name in. I'm a constituent and live in North Carolina or California or Kansas or wherever it is that you live and send it in to your congressperson or or multiple congresspersons from your state. And we found that this is very, very effective in terms of getting additional co-sponsors on our legislation. So um, all you have to do, so this would be the process, is call the office of your member of Congress. You see the phone number here on the slide and ask for the email for their legislative director. So this is a standard position that all of your members of Congress are gonna have. It's an employee for them, the, the person that handles their legislation. So ask for the email for their, the email address for their legislative director, and then email him or her the letter that you've downloaded and modified and ask that member to co-sponsor HR 4052. Let's go to the next slide. So if you need help, uh, with this process, email us, our, our office, info at nibcoalition.com, or give us a call, and we'll be happy to walk you through how to download the letter, uh, some good ideas about how to modify it, and, and that sort of thing. So this is really a very simple way that uh, you would be able to help us out in our efforts at getting more congressional co-sponsors. So... Um, here you can see uh, on this slide our action page on our website. Our website is nibcoalition.com. Uh, if you click on the action page, you'll uh, uh, get some great information. We also have a downloadable flyer that you would be able to download, print out, 
and be able to um, send to your congressperson, your local representatives and such. And we found that these efforts by uh, local constituents are extremely helpful in terms of building support and getting the additional congressional co-sponsors that we need. So for those of you who said, what can I do to help? Here's a very, very simple uh, thing that you can do. It might take uh, five or 10 minutes, but a great thing that you could do to help us uh, build the momentum and keep that ball rolling. So um, now we are going to move on to Q&A. And so if you have any uh, questions, uh, please raise your hand or wave your hand and, and we will try to get to you. Uh, I'd like to go to uh, Representative Harry Benton. Harry, are you still on the line? Yes, I see you, okay. And um, you know, you, were, you talked about um, uh, the uh, migrant, uh, the, the, the funding costs the, uh, with the huge amount of migrants that you have in your area and apprenticeship programs. And you know, one of the co co common comments I hear from the business community is that the lack of workers is really a drag on their individual businesses and a drag on the economy. So can we um, set up programs, apprenticeship programs for migrants to be able to train them to get good paying jobs? And is that something that, um, that folks in the union are, are thinking about, or people in Illinois, are they thinking about that? How, how can uh, migrants be become productive members of the community? Yeah, there's been some conversations with that. Uh, I was just at Illinois Manufacturers Association created a manufacturers caucus and incorporated with that one there's a lot of training and vocational programs because a lot of the manufacturers have put out statements that they want to see the migrants have work authorization to try to fill some of those vacancies and then also there are some programs that we can talk about through unions we have one of the strongest union cities in america uh, we have one of the largest union presence in america in illinois and chicago so we can work on that. Some of some of it is a little tricky with work authorizations because it still is a federal issue. Uh, again, with the budget, we've spent between Chicago and the state of Illinois, we've spent over a billion dollars already uh, with migrants coming in and then working on out migration programs. So folks that are coming here are going to be incorporated into society. They they are going to need housing. They are going to need transportation. And that is one of the challenging things about the apprenticeship program, not only just for migrants, but for anybody from a, a low-income community is transportation. That's our number one issue when we end up getting apprentices in or applicants. So uh, that could be part of the challenge is creating subsidies for that through apprenticeship programs, expanding that out. Uh, I, I want to get more shop classes back into high schools. I've been working on that pretty nonstop. Any, I'm one of the few people in the entire General Assembly in the state of Illinois that only has a high school education because I decided to go the trade route. And I don't have $150,000 worth of student loans that I'm repaying. And I have a house that's worth double what I paid for it because I was able to get in at the right time. And, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of perks about being in organized labor, especially the building trades. Uh, now we're one of the highest paid in the country. And that is what some of the challenges with our infrastructure too. When you're talking about 120 to $140 an hour for most trades in the state of Illinois with all factors included that's expensive it's a little bit different than some of the southern regions where they have right to work and they're paying 20 or 30 dollars but while they're paying that then taxpayers are making it up mainly from other states too so we're we're a payer state in the state of illinois we're lucky if we get 81 cents back on the dollar and then my county is the lowest return county in the state so we get 65 cents back on top of only the 81 cents. And my town, the median household income is 133,000. And people are, working families are almost barely making it between childcare costs, property taxes. My property taxes are $10,000 a year. Uh, it's, it's challenging in the state of Illinois. 
So uh, I'm always, always, always going to push trained vocational programs. That was a really long answer. <laughs> I apologize for that one, no, but I'm very passionate about, it. I'm third generation union on both sides of my family. And my grandfather raised my father on, on union wages. My grandfather raised my mother on union wages and my parents raised me on union wages. And now I'm doing it with my family and I've got a broke legislator salary too. Yeah, that, that one's awesome. <laughs> I think that um, it really helps illustrate the, the point, though, that a national infrastructure bank can really help improve the lot of the middle class. And uh, it seems like these things are so interconnected, the need for affordable housing, the need for apprenticeship and training programs, the need for um, more workers to, so that our economy can grow. And I'd like to ask our economists to weigh in on this and maybe help en enlighten us on this topic. Dr. Prinz, and we also have um, Dr. Andy Winnick here. He's a economics professor from California. Would either one of you like to address this um, uh, topic? Naomi, you want to start? Sure. You're muted. This came up again in, in one of the conversations we had we had this morning with with um with the, with the center's office actually this idea of marrying labor and the financing for economic infrastructure because you cannot build one without the other and so the idea of the national infrastructure bank is to be able to um, to pay appropriate wages um, to union workers and workers that need to actually create the infrastructure that we need to build as well as financing. Um, their jobs um, and and also the the tools, the supplies, the the infrastructure to build the infrastructure that we need. And so it's really the idea of marrying both. And that's one of the sort of beautiful things about this particular proposal. It's not like a loan from a large private bank who who doesn't particularly care the loan nor the private bank about who's really doing the work at the other end. The idea here is to use the NIB to grow the economy. And you need to grow both the labor side and the physicality of infrastructure side, because you can't have one without the other um, in order to have an economy that doesn't have an 123% debt to growth or debt to economic size ratio, but can get much, much better than that. Thank, thank you, Nomi. Dr. Winnick? Well, yeah, let me just add, add a couple of quick things. I mean, you know, I a long-term college professor teaching lots of different classes and so forth. And 80% of my students did not, did, were the first in their generation to go to college. 75 to 80% of my students work at least half time or they don't go to college. Uh, you know, I, I've taught at other schools where they're, they're sending students abroad so they get a study abroad experience. But for the students I was teaching in LA, that was not possible because they had to work, they'll pay their rent, on their parents' house, or neither they nor their parents had a place to sleep. So that, you know, I think we have to understand that the level of income and the level of wages has just not been adequate. And expanding the, the job experiences and the salary range is really critical. And so I think, you know, these really are tied together. I want to make one other comment. We've had a couple of question, comments about transportation and what have you. I, I don't know if you really understand that the National Infrastructure Bank that we developed is the model that is used all around the world. The European Union has one, and that's how they have built high-speed railroad. You can go at 200 miles an hour from Portugal all the way to the Czech Republic, from Naples, Italy to Scotland, across the, you know under the under the Channel, all you know a couple hundred miles an hour. You can't do that in other places. And it was funded by uh, largely and coordinated by a national infrastructure, an international infrastructure. Bank. Japan's done the same thing. China has three of these banks and has done the same thing. You know, uh, South Korea has done this. Australia has done this. I mean, it is we. It, the irony is that we invented the idea. We've used it four times, and now we act like we never heard of it. And it's just, it's just, in, it's just insane. And there is no alternative to this because there's no possibility. That the, especially right now, given our government's dis dysfunctionality, but there's no possibility, given the budget situation, of getting a lot of money through the through the federal budget. That's not going to happen. The inf national infrastructure law that already exists was originally planned to be three and a half trillion dollars. It came out at a half of one trillion dollars. We're not going to get what we need. 
We need the five to seven trillion dollars in the National Infrastructure Bank, or we're not going to be able to address all these problems that everybody's been talking about. And I'll stop with that. Thank you for your um, input. I'd like to um, go to Representative Nugent from Vermont here briefly. And it seemed like in your presentation, you were talking about kind of the need to recreate the American dream and, and that what families want these days are uh, to be able to, to have a better life for, for their children and have that future for them. And um, is that a um, something that you hear when you talk to the folks in your district there in Vermont that they're um, concerned with um, making those improvements and and uh, in their lives? Yeah, that comes through in all sorts of stories. I, um, you know, one person I was talking to um, was worried about the improvements and the, the local taxes that needed to be raised um, in part to deal with um, some of the crumpling school infrastructure um, on her the townhome that she was in and she was renting but she was worried that her landlord would be forced to increase the rent even though he didn't want to do that for uh, profitability just for the having to pay for the taxes so i think um that was one thing property tax comes up a lot comes up a lot um you hear the people from illinois that is very resonating with us um and that i think is also a direct result of um, not having the right tool to invest in these kind of projects. Um, you know, and there's people just, just feeling like, I think the pandemic make people feel kind of hollowed out and disconnected and, you know, that their kids are kind of behind um, academically still and that um, the schools are focusing on, on not necessarily focusing on that enough. So those were some themes, I think. Um, also like substance use and crime is kind of a visible sign of, again, the middle class not being strong enough and not bringing enough people into it. So the, yeah, it, it kind of came through, I think, in like every conversation that I had. It's interesting because we, we see those same concerns, big states, small states, low population states, large population states, big cities, it's, it's everywhere. We all have those same concerns. Um, so I would like to, um, go to uh, New York and Matt Miller. And um, so we did learn not to go swimming in the Hudson River. So that came through loud and clear, but <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering if you can repeat, what is the name of that bridge and why was it rejected for funding? Uh, I mean, we have heard from a lot of people yeah. that it's very challenging to apply for funding to the federal government under the Infrastructure Act uh, because it's so paperwork intensive and so specific and, and that kind of thing. But can you maybe um, tell us a little bit more about that bridge? Yeah, the name is a Lincoln Avenue bridge. Um, and uh, it's a great, <laughs> I wish I could answer why we got rejected, right? Um, I guess, as I mentioned, uh, more than a few uh, regulation, uh, regulatory agencies uh, have essentially condemned it. I mean, it's it's still working, it still functions, but it's, you know, they've said, this is, this is no good. It's, it's too dangerous. It doesn't work any longer. And, you know, it, and again, it's so critical. It needs to be replaced. Um, because I'm a county legislator, I can't speak maybe as much as to why, but I know even um, one of our local state legislators, Pat Fahey around here, um, is fairly influential and she, she was somewhat shocked as well. Um, uh, so I don't have a real good answer as to why, especially when everybody knows how bad it is and how important it is. Um, but you know, we're hopeful they're going to go back in again uh, through other means and other uh, applications and try to still get that money because it's not something we can really wait on. I think that the, the last conversation I saw on it was, you know, maybe in 2028, but that's just way too long. It's not a timeline we can even potentially think about. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. I'm going to look up that bridge and learn more about it. Yes. <laughs> I, would, I would just add that up. Uh, the basic problem here is the bipartisan infrastructure law was just simply too small. When yeah, President right. Biden went around talking about fixing all these bridges that are in condemned condition like yours, uh, he was still talking as if the, the the bipartisan infrastructure law was going to solve the whole problem. It never was enough mm -hmm. money at the get-go. Uh, it paid for uh, maybe uh, the bridge that collapsed in Pittsburgh, and it mm -hmm. paid for the Brent Spence Bridge. And by the time you've do a couple like that, all that money's gone. So there was not enough, simply not enough for your bridge. All right. 
And, and that's the beauty of the infrastructure bank is that you would not be competing. There is enough right. money and it's long term that you would not be pitting each other different different cities against each other. You could fund it all. And that and that's the crucial thing. It's, it takes the five five trillion dollars to have a shot at doing that. Um Thank you, Dr. Winnick. I'd like to go to uh, Representative Burns in Michigan, who had talked a little bit about how Michigan is known as being an, an automobile state. And, uh, but of course she's a proponent for mass transit, but couldn't the automobile, automobile industry adopt their technology or use their knowledge of transportation to do things like work on high-speed rail, electric trains and buses and, and that sort of thing? Um, and of course, that would take an investment, no doubt, in factories, plants, R and D, and so so on. But um, is the auto industry in Michigan looking to the future and looking to maybe transition to more of a mass transit orientation? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think it's a great one. Um, I'll start on an optimistic note. I think certainly it's entirely possible um, that the auto industry, and in particular for Michigan, um, the big three would make that transition. Um, I do think there is interest in kind of changing how we move people. Um, recently in the city of Detroit, they just unveiled within the last month or two, um, the first kind of electric vehicle charging roadway um, in the entire country to the best of my knowledge. I think that's how it was built. Um, so so that's very exciting. Um, Ford Motor Company several years ago purchased um, the old uh, train depot, uh, which folks may be familiar with. Um, it was throughout my lifetime um, kind of seen as a symbol of the city's decay, uh, which is really unfortunate because it's always been kind of a beautiful shell. Um, and now it's being revitalized, which is wonderful to see. Um, so I think that that will be a new hub for Ford Motor. Um, they're investing in these, you know, EV charging roadways, I'm kind of easing into that, um, autonomous vehicles. And we are seeing a lot of change um, within the city of Detroit around like the Joe Lewis um, Greenway, which is a beautiful uh, walking trail that connects the city to other inner ring suburbs. So we're seeing, I think, a lot of change in terms of, you know, these greenways, um, roadways are being redesigned to be you know, greener boulevards, um, you know, we're carving out space for, you know, bicyclist um, traffic as well for bike lanes on some of our major roads. So we're seeing some of that. Um, is the auto industry ready to completely kind of switch gears or lean heavily into mass transit? Not that I've seen yet. Um, I haven't seen a strong indicator of that, to be quite honest. Um, what we are seeing is that they are leaning really heavily into electric vehicles. Um, and Ford Motor Company in particular is essentially nixing sedans, which is a bummer for me because I'm five foot two and as a smaller person, I just want to drive a car. Um, but Ford Motor Company and, and some of the other um, big three automakers are really leaning into, you know, SUVs, pickup trucks, all these bigger vehicles, um, which to me, quite frankly, is disheartening, um, in part because I think it just limits consumers' options pretty drastically. Um, I think people deserve to have options and a variety of choices. So that's a little disheartening for me. Um, and I don't, I don't know what that signals in terms of kind of a massive shift um, in what they're looking at. But I do think, you know, if they're leaning into electric vehicles as the way of the future and acknowledging, um, you know, carbon emissions from vehicles and the impact that has on climate change and how we all are able to live and where we're able to live and thrive, um, I certainly think they would be wise to invest in mass transit. Um, I don't know that we're there yet, quite frankly, but I look forward to uh, the day where I can give an enthusiastic thumbs up on that. That brings us to the end of our presentation this evening. I do have a couple slides I wanna show real quick. So um, Angela, if you could bring up those final slides. Oh, here's our action page again. Uh, and for more information, you can go to our website. Here's our Facebook page. We have a Twitter. Um, I do want to remind everybody that this is purely and totally a volunteer grassroots effort. We have no uh, millionaire or billionaire uh, funders. And so we rely on donations from uh, folks like you. And so if any of you are so inclined and would be uh, interested in going to our website, we do have a donate button and uh, would love to um, 
have you help us in, in our activities. And so the, the funding that we get goes to pay for our webinars, our website presence. We pay for advertising. We've done a lot of advertising around the country, social media and that sort of thing. So your donation would be much appreciated. So please uh, visit our website and please download the letter uh, to your congressperson and help us get some more attention and get some more sponsors. So thank you everyone. Really appreciate your being here this evening and we hope to see you next month. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye Anora.